My friends, Christmas has come early for this fanboy. I've actually got my hands on an original Emu Emacs. Mind is blown. Let's have some geek talk. Hi guys, and welcome to Geek Talk, where we talk deep and geek about pianos, keyboards, synthesizers, and music production. And I have got my hands on an original Emacs Emu HDSE. Mind is absolutely blown. Let's get into this. Before we jump into this, understand that this video is not going to be an in-depth analysis of this piece of equipment. Um, as I say, I've literally had it for a few days and I have only scratched the surface of it. I'm busy reading through the manual and therefore I am not going to be going too much into too much detail. But I will be talking in this video about generally about Emu, the Emaxes, the emulators, and just my sort of personal feelings about the, the, the equipment they would made and the company in general. Um, I'd like to make a special shout out to my good friend and fellow channel member, Simon Forsyth. Now, you guys probably know the name Simon Forsyth if you're in my Facebook group, and you will know that Simon is has become kind of a key member um, to this community. Uh, he's not only become a very dear friend to me, but he's almost like this kind of silent member of the Vaughan George community. He's one of the moderators of my Facebook group. And I want to kind of just push him a little bit into the, 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 the limelight here. Because I know he's not a look at me, look at me kind of guy. But here is something that a lot of you do not know about Simon Forsyth. And I'm going to tell you now. If you guys remember... About 10 years ago, Alan Wilder was selling a lot of his uh, equipment as part of an auction. And you guys probably remember this scene. Dug out the old Emaxes that I used to use on stage. This one here is the very Emacs I used on the devotional tour. And I sent it off to a friend of mine who repaired them and managed to get this one going for us. Now, as you see in that clip, Alan Wilder was talking about sending that Emacs to a friend of his to get it working. And I'm pleased to tell you that the friend he was talking about was Simon and also Tom J. Carpenter, who is also a, uh, a member of the community here. And Tom J. Carpenter runs the Analog uh, Solutions uh, Synthesizer Company. Check them out, some outstanding, outstanding pieces of kit. So I feel that this is important that you know about Simon's history with the EMU um, products, and also that he was actually the guy who helped Alan Wilder get his EMUs up and running. So for Simon to actually show up with one of these uh, the other day, my mind was absolutely blown. And I do believe that Simon actually owns two of these himself, and I think he's got an original emulator too as well. But you'll be pleased to know that Simon will be, um, time permitting, coming to this channel, and we will be doing a lot of discussions on the Emu Emaxes. And there is no one better than Simon to actually talk about this. When he came here on Sunday and he stripped this thing apart because he's doing a few modifications on it, my mind was absolutely blown. I had no idea what he was doing. Now, you guys in this channel and my community, you know we are such big Alan Wilder fanboys. And just to think that our friend Simon was the, the actual guy that was restoring Alan Wilder's Emaxes, you know, for his auctions. Just shows that there is no one that I know personally, or or even Alan probably knows personally, who knows as much about the Emacs um, products as much as what Simon does. So I'm very excited to be getting Simon onto the channel, and we're going to be doing a lot on this piece of kit. Now remember that this thing will, I, I feel, become a cornerstone of this channel. As you know, in my album review series, I, I have had access to the original Depeche Mode sounds. And a lot of you have said, well, that's great, Vaughn, but wouldn't it be nice if you, had, if you had like an actual Emacs to demonstrate the sounds? Well, my friends, that day has come. And here it is. Now, if you guys remember this famous video clip. It has a total of 36 different banks. So each song has its own set of sounds. And on Black Celebration, I've got uh, several sounds allocated to specific parts of the keyboard. Yeah. So the first sound is... 
That clip, of course, is a piece of history, and you will recognize that the the keyboard in that clip is indeed this model here, which is the Emacs uh, SEHD. Now, there were different models of this, and as I say, I'm not going to go in depth. I just want to sort of scratch the surface and let you know my feelings on this instrument initially. Now, as I say, I I know quite a bit about the the emus and the emulators and the emaxes. Um, so far as uh, uh, general information is concerned, I know quite a bit about them. But of course, I have never had the privilege of actually having one um, in my possession. Thank you so much, Simon. Now, this machine was released in 1986, and I don't know if it's the actual machine that they would have taken on the Black Celebration tour. I believe it would be if this was released in 1986. But I know for sure that this particular instrument was the instrument which you see on the 101, the Mode 101 and the, you know, the tour for the masses. These were taken on the road. And this was a fascinating and new piece of technology at the time. Because if we look at the, the beginning of the, the emulator, the first uh, emu emulator came out in 1981. And the reason these were such popular samplers was because up until that point, all you had was the Fairlight. Now, the Fairlight, I believe, used to retail for about $30,000. Imagine that, $30,000. It just makes you realize how, how much easier it is to make records these days. Because imagine how much gear you could buy for $30,000 these days. But anyway, going back to the, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, a Fairlight was $30,000. And not only that... If you if you hired, you know, you wouldn't necessarily buy one. Most studios used to hire them. But then you would have to hire an engineer or a programmer to work the thing because it wasn't something you could just hire and, and use. It was it was like you, you need to be like a rocket scientist or an astrophysicist. But then, of course, emulator, when EMU came into the market, by releasing the, the, the original emulator in 1981, they made it very easy for... A, a complete new generation of musicians to get into electronic music because I believe the original emulator and indeed the emu emulator 2 which came out in 1984 had a price tag of just under eight thousand dollars with the um, emulator plus being about ten thousand dollars so you're looking at about you know less than a third of the price and that is why these machines were so popular in fact if you look at this model which is the emulator 2 that is the one that it was very popularly seen on the, you know, on the Pet Shop Boys videos. Uh, it's also seen in Depeche Mode's live in Hamburg. You'll see Alan Wilder playing one. And it's a very impressive instrument, you know, with, with, with a big box on the top. Now, this particular machine, the, the Emacs um, SEHD, came out in 1986. And this one was even more affordable. I believe this one coming out at the sort of $3,000 price tag. And then once again, that obviously be more, uh, more affordable, allowed more musicians access to it. Now, that you can imagine at $3,000 is, you know, 10% of the price of a Fairlight. But of course, by 1986, sampling wasn't a, um, a, a new thing. You know, it had been done quite a lot. Now, this machine being 8 or 12-bit might seem quite... Uh, primitive in you know it, it, with with regard to today's standards you know where we've gone 8 bit 12 bit 16 bit uh, 32 bit floating floating depth and all that stuff i was always fascinated by this machine but i did think that there was a lot of you know when people used to talk about it i thought okay well maybe that's just nostalgia talking i'm here to tell you that when you turn this thing on there there is a sound and a character to it that i have not ever heard on anything other than this to me is the sound of Depeche Mode from about 86 to 90 and it is also the sound of Pet Shop Boys um, it has such a character and with all the, um, the, the, the access we have to great musical technology these days you really need to go back to this time and listening to the sounds that you can make on this machine um, what you do realize is, is that the sounds are not as sophisticated by as today's standards. However, as a producer, and I'm sure you as a producer, if you're a producer as well, it's not about the quality of the sound or the realism. It's about the character. And of course, these days we are blessed with sample libraries and 
plugins and things being so cheap and, and, and easily available. And there's a lot of people just buying the same plugins. And, and I'm always saying is to get a unique sound, you really need to limit yourself. And, and I find that going back to this time, will allow you to do that. Now, the, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking of my, my friend Espen Croft, um, who has his own YouTube channel. Check him out. He's an awesome guy. And Espen Croft is really an absolute guru on 80s gear. In fact, he only uses things that are sort of from the 80s and he's an absolute purist. Now me, I'm not that type of um, musician or producer. I, I like to use modern technology. But as I say, turning this machine on, it, it has a character. And that is a word I'm going to use a lot is character. It is a character and, and, and a presence and, and, and j just the sort of tonality of the sounds. It is so black celebration. It is so music for the masses. It is so violatory. It, 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 it's the sound of Depeche Mode from 86 to 90. And, and, and it's the sound of Pet Shop Boys. Guys, my mind is absolutely blown. Now, as I say, I'm not going to do any sort of like practical demonstrations. I'm going to play a couple of sounds just to give you a few ideas. But as I say, moving forward, we are going to do a lot of in-depth analysis on this incredibly iconic piece of kit and the emulators in general. Now, something that is absolutely fabulous about this machine and something I haven't seen in such a long time is, oh my God, floppy disks, floppy disks. Oh my God. <laughs> the last time I used these was back in 1996, 97, when I released my debut album, which I will do a separate video on later. I don't want to get distracted, but to the younger ones out there, this is how we used to roll. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load this um, into this machine. Now just for those of you who are not producers, um, understand that this keyboard doesn't actually have sounds built into it. It's not a synthesizer. So um, obviously keyboards come in the form of synthesizers and some synthesizers as you know you turn it on and you can generate sounds. Well, think of this as a playback machine. Think of it as, as, a, as a sort of like a tape recorder. So when you're loading sounds into it, the sounds I'm loading into it now are, are sounds from the original Emu library. Um, so what this machine does is when you buy it, it's, it doesn't have anything in it. You load sounds into it and you can sample sounds into it. In fact, later on, what I'm going to do is because a lot of you who aren't musicians have asked me to demonstrate and explain what a sampler is. And I think this is a very good way to explain it rather than demonstrating it on a software sampler. This way I can actually stick a source or a microphone into this and I will explain to you and show you how this works. Um, one of the key things that comes to my mind now is if you think of behind the wheel, you've got that ha 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 you know, that Martin Gore sample. And how that would have been done was, was simply sticking a microphone into this and going ha, and then, and then by mapping it and playing it on the keyboard, you go ha 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 And that's essentially how a sampler works. I'm, I'm sure m most people who are not musicians understand that. So I don't want to sort of become, I don't want to come across as condescending, but that is something I want to do in a late, a later video is to, is, is to discuss and demonstrate to you how a sampler works in, in sort of very layman's terms for everyone to be able to understand. So what I'm going to do now is guys, I'm going to load this, um, floppy disk into the machine here. Now, as I say, this is when you when you would buy these machines back in 1986, they would also come with a few disks which would have sounds on them. Now, the sounds that were on these disks were sampled from several sources. And the interesting thing is, is when you listen to these, the, a lot of the presets, and I don't have access to them all, you will actually hear the sound of many famous records. You will hear Pet Shop Boys, you will hear Depeche Mode. Um, anyway, should we just load one up and show you what I mean? Now, when we fire this baby up, you can just hear the, uh, uh, uh. now this one does actually have a hard drive in it, but I believe Simon is making a few modifications to it. He has also put a SCSI port in the back here for various types of file transfer. Once again, Simon is an absolute guru. Right. So the disc I'm going to load in now, uh, it's called Makato strings. So. You quite simply just load it into the side, to the side here. Yep. 
and then you press this button here which says load bank and then it starts to find it enter and there you've got the you hear that sound <laughs> oh man this is the sound of my youth right the sound is now loaded and ready to be played and this was a problem that Depeche Mode used to face back in the day was you know the loading time we you know when songs started it's not today with like like with samplers today and technology where things are instantaneous these babies had to load from a disc and very risky taking these onto stage you know because they did have disc failure and all kinds of things um, and that is why they always carried spares Right, so the disc is now loaded and the sounds are on available to be played. And you can actually hear this particular one, which is called high string. Uh, just listen to the tonality of it. Um, that is West End Girls right there. Uh, what was it? So, as I say, when you fire this up and you go, oh my god, that is the sound they used. It may not have been that exact sound, but you can hear the tonality. Um, I'm going to show you another example now. I'm going to load another disc. This one's called Electric Bass. So we simply just add it in. We press Load Bank. We press Enter. And wait for it to load. As it takes time to load, I'm just thinking it must have been quite nerve-wracking in the day when you're, you know, you're Depeche Mode standing on stage and the the song starts and you're trying to get the thing loaded. Come on, come on, I need to load. Come on, baby, come on. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so the next disc is loaded, um, and this one is uh, a bass disc. So the first sample we get is... Now, obviously, these sounds by today's standard are dated. However, as I say, they have a character to them. And if, if I take that sound, for example, that to me is behind the wheel. Now, it is not the exact sound they use for behind the wheel, but just listen to the tonality of it. As I say, that is not the exact sound that was used on Behind the Wheel. Uh, it, it would have been an octave lower. But I'm just wanting you to sort of hear the tonality. J just the tonality and the character of the sound here is so Depeche Mode. And, and what Simon always told me uh, about these, these machines is, is that when you load sounds into them, uh, it, it, there, there is something in the sort of lower mid frequency that just really sort of pops. There is something about the sound of this thing. And, you know... Some people might go, oh, 8-bit, that's, you know, when, when I think 8-bit, I think of the old Nintendo uh, dr games consoles, you know, with that bit crushed, crappy kind of sound. But there is something about the character of this, of, of this machine. Now, if we go back to the string sounds in this library, just to sort of um, illustrate a point here. Um, if, if I play... <laughs> Now, by today's standards, this the, these aren't um, incredibly authentic sounds. I mean... If you were to get a sample library, you know, these days, or turn on a synthesizer, a, a, a modern synthesizer or keyboard, the string sounds are incredible. But, but, it's not about... I, I personally feel we've come to a point in technology where things are just mind-blowingly good to the point that they've lost character. If you can forgive me being philosophical for a while. I was speaking to a, a, a female friend of mine once and she, she said that Jack Nicholson is like, so, is like such a rugged, sexy guy and she likes Tommy Lee Jones. I was like, what? Jack Nicholson and Tommy Lee Jones? And, and, then, and then we talked about like, I don't know, she mentioned some really like pretty boys like, uh, I don't know, Brad Pitt, who, who doesn't do it for her. And I think she made me think um, that, you know, sometimes things can be too beautiful. And sometimes using the Tommy Lee Jones analogy, she just saw him as like a really rough and rugged and sexy kind of guy. And I know we're going completely off topic, but you're used to that on this channel. But that is, 
there is relevance in that. I think with modern synthesizers, the sounds are so, you know, when you pull up any modern synthesizer and just play it, you know, it's, it's, it's wide and it's, it's, it's loud and it's, and it's like, it's so three dimensional. It's like, wow. But you turn on something like this, um, there is character and it is something I'm going to try my best to illustrate throughout this series. Um, I'm going to record the sound in very, very high definition and we can do A-B comparisons. As I say, I've had my hands on this machine for a few days now and I've downloaded the manual online and I'm learning a lot about synthesis from that manual. Um, the manual is very simple. This is a very easy to use machine. I was surprised at its, its, its usability, its hands-on it, it just invites you in. And you know, we've been talking on this channel, we often have discussions about analog versus digital. And then we talk about in the box and out the box. Now, of course, analog versus digital is irrelevant in this case because this is a digital a machine. But in the case of in the box versus out the box versus plugins versus real machines, what I've found, I've come to the conclusion that it's Although you can achieve great results using analog or digital, or you can achieve great results using hardware or software, um, there is just something, it's the tactile, the hands-on feel uh, of using a real instrument. You know, guys, my very, very first album I did, as I say, in 1996, 1997, was done on this. This here is the MC50 Mark II Micro Composer. And I did my first two albums on this thing. We'll do a separate video on this and you know this this takes floppy disks. Um, it, it's quite funny when I sort of like coach people I, I sometimes show the younger guys this machine and, they, and they're like how the hell did you make a record on that? And it comes back to this time where and I've discussed this in my video interview with Espen Craft was when you created music in those days <laughs> before music was so sort of computer based. You had no choice, you had to listen because this sequencer, when you're programming a song, all you've got is this, is, was it a th uh, 64 character backlit display? And you're, you have no choice but to just listen. So you, you're not, I find these days often people are staring at a screen when they're producing and, and very often when I'm coaching people and they send me their songs, I'm like, okay, now go back and mix that song not because I can hear you've been listening to the screen and that might sound a bit arrogant that I could tell someone's been looking at the screen but I, I, I think there was a time where we used to listen more and with technology now very often we're staring at a screen and this takes us back to a time where things were you had to listen more because you had no choice and this instrument along with instruments of that time and I don't want to sound like I'm stuck in the past because I've been working very modernly for the for the you know for a great number of years, but just turning something on like this and you know just loading sounds into it, it 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 it's fascinating. It's it's so inspiring, and I find it's when we come to the sort of digital versus analog, or when we come to the debate of hardware versus software plugins. Although both ways can achieve you know outstanding results. I think with this sort of hands-on approach, it does inspire you to work in a different way. And also I find with a, with a sort of like hardware approach, you know, there, there's a lot less predictability. There's a, you know, things tend to go wrong. And 80% of innovation in the studio I find is, is happy accidents. Things go wrong and you're like, oh, I don't know what went wrong there, but I like the sound of that and I'll have that. Another interesting thing is you guys know that when I do my Depeche Mode album review series, you know, you guys know I do have um, a lot of the original sounds. But now Simon has told me that despite the fact that the original sounds I've got are sampled to a very, very high standard, when you actually get the original sounds and you load them into this machine, this machine adds a character to it and, and, and then they'll sound different. He says they sound better. And from what I've heard from this machine so far is, and it's very difficult to explain this, it's, it's one of those times where, you know, we, where you don't have the vocabulary to explain the emotion. But this machine, from what I can tell so far, it is so inspiring. In fact that, you know, I've got some music that I'm supposed to be releasing really soon. And after getting this baby, I've put the releases on hold because I want to generate some sounds and put, I just want, want to use some of the 
sounds from this and, and I want to do some sampling through this and put it onto my new records. In fact, when I was interviewing Rich Silverthorne from um, Mesh, I, he did tell me that the reason they bought an Emacs 2 was despite the fact that it is an old machine, sampling into it gives it, it 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 has a sound and a grit and i think to the younger generation they might look at this and go oh well you know it's a bit old fashioned you know we can do this all much quicker on software and indeed we can but it is not until you actually get something like this and you fire it up and then then your lights kind of go on and you go okay well this is great and what i love about this this is limitation this is one of the problems i also find when i'm coaching people is is and indeed, when I produce music these days, is, is there is almost like no limitation. You know, you can keep adding things. And, you know, back in these days, there was limitation. When you could sample, I think this thing can only sample for, is it about five seconds? I'm not sure. But you had so many limitations. And remember that necessity is the mother of invention. It is the mother of innovation. And by just just the, the sheer fact that th this machine and, 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 and things of that time had this this limitation to them, that limitation spawned some of the greatest records in, in you know, in, in history. And, and I, I do believe that a lot of the records that were made at that time, as my friend Espen Craft keeps saying, will live through the, you know, will, will live the test of time and will live forever. Okay, guys, um, as I say, forgive me if this video was not completely focused. As I say, it was just a general discussion. As you guys can just see the elation and the excitement I'm feeling about this. Simon, mate, thank you so much for bringing this here thing and I thank you for bringing me <laughs> yes Simon thank you very much for bringing this and as I say guys we're going to be doing a lot more videos on this as I say when you turn this on it's the sound of Depeche Mode it's the sound of Pet Shop Boys and a lot of artists from the time they were all using this a absolutely fascinating machine as I say I always had a a, a sort of like a fascination with it and but I did think that when people talked about it having a sound and I thought that was more nostalgia but just having it for a few days and listening to it and this has made me realize more than ever that limitation is a beautiful thing and there is a character a, a sonic identity to the sound and just the way it generates sound that it's just so stand out it, it just t seems to pop out the speakers I my mind is blown and it it is a it is very sad that the uh, emulator emu company did go bankrupt and i remember the very first sort of emulator keyboards i saw was when i was the keyboards salesman in turnkey sort of like in early 2000 and i remember i remember the e synth and the e4k and the e4xt and, and all those samplers and stuff as i say I, I remember the modern ones which sort of came out in the late 90s but i have as i say this is the first time i've ever seen an emacs and my mind is blown. Okay, I think we're going to end this video right here, guys. As I say, I cannot wait to get under the hood of this and to do some interview videos with my good friend Simon, who's going to explain this in a way that is mind-blowingly uh, interesting. And even if you're not a musician or a geek or a producer, I think you will find this series of interviews on this instrument fascinating. This is the iconic sound of 86 to about 1990 it, it, it's just here the sonic character and everything that we get from this machine is just absolutely mind-blowing guys look forward to that in-depth series of videos coming soon the Depeche Mode album review series will continue along with some other fabulous videos if I do say so myself please hit that subscribe button um, and jump into this community if you are new to this channel um, check out my social media I am on Facebook I also have a Facebook group and we also have a new Facebook group which is called uh, Vaughan George Producers and Artist Forum which is especially for you if you're an artist and a producer and want to jump into this community. Uh, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter. I'm everywhere guys, <laughs> trying my best. Thank you so much for your support for all of those of you who've been with me from the beginning and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Take care of yourself. Adios.